Welcome to Pete's Dog Talk TV. I am Dr. Mona Amin, a board certified pediatrician and mom. And on this episode, we're talking all about head injuries, what to do in the moment, basic first aid, what you're going to be monitoring, and so much more. Before we continue, make sure you hit that subscribe button because that's how you stay up to date on all of the videos here on Pete's Dog Talk TV. And follow me on Instagram at Pete's Dog Talk for so much more. And here we go. So I released two episodes today. One is in regards to head injuries, which is what you're watching now, and the other is in regards to mouth injuries. So make sure you watch both, because when your child gets injured, there's a chance they could injure both, and you would wanna know what to do in these situations. When your child gets injured, it can be really scary. I hope by the end of this video you feel a little more confident in what you're going to be monitoring, basic first aid, and what you're doing in the moment when your child injures themselves. The reality is kids do get hurt, even with all of the prevention tips I'm going to be going over. So it's important to know what we can do to reduce the risk of injury, but also what to do if your child is injured. So first, in terms of prevention in the home, so number one reason I see head injuries in my office is falls from a changing table or bed. So this is really important. Babies can roll way before you think they can roll. Newborns can sometimes get the momentum of their arm to roll them over. So I don't want you to underestimate your child's ability to roll. It's very important that if your child is on a higher surface that you are by their side the entire time they're on that surface. This includes beds. It can take just one moment for them to spin and roll off. So it's really important that you're monitoring these things in your home. I find parents come in so guilty, they feel terrible. No one is blaming you, no one is making you feel bad. It's important to remember that if this does happen, you want to make sure that you're more precautious for the future. Another safety tip is that if you're not comfortable with changing babies on a bed or on a changing table, you can change them on the ground. You won't have any falls on the ground, so that's another option if you are concerned about falls from a changing table or a bed. The other part is childproofing your home, gates on stairs, furniture that they can climb up on, furniture that can topple down on them. These should all be mounted. Your child should never be in a room on their own that would have the ability for them to climb on a furniture from a high level. Remember for corners of tables, so this includes coffee tables, dining tables, you want to make sure you add one of those corner edges or padding to those tables in case they trip and fall and hit their face on those edges. Remember we do the best that we can, even with all of this in injuries happen. Most commonly I see these injuries in those toddler years when a child is learning how to walk, getting more comfortable on their two feet, and this can happen. Please don't blame yourself for when these injuries happen, but know in the future, well, what can I do to reduce the risk as much as possible? So head injuries can happen in many cases. Obviously we have more severe cases like motor vehicle accidents, traumas that are more severe. I'm talking about those minor head injuries that occur on the playground or when your child's outside or maybe even in the home. So now I'm gonna go over a step-by-step -step way of evaluating your child and managing your child after a head injury. Step one, I need you to take a breath. You are sitting in the park and you notice your child fall from the playground. I need you to take a moment before you rush over there. You are going to go there, but you need to compose yourself. I know how emotional it can be. My son has had minor injuries, most recently with his mouth. It's very traumatizing for them, and it's also very traumatizing for us as parents. So take that breath. You need that breath to stay as calm as possible. I know inside you may not be calm. It's okay to cry and, and let it out into a pillow after it all happens. That's okay. I've done that too. But in the moment when your child's in pain, they need you to be as strong as reasonably possible. The next step is to assess the consciousness of your child. They're either conscious or they're not. If your child is not conscious, an example of this would be a child who's laying on the ground not responding, you need to call 911 to have them transport your child to an emergency room. If you don't have a phone or you're in the moment, I want you to yell to some other adult who's around you if there is another adult to call 911 so that they can give the location of where you're at. If you have no other adult available, you need to get on the phone and call 911. This is really important, even if the child loses consciousness and comes back to. It's still important that that child needs to be evaluated in an emergency room. They're gonna assess, does that child need a CAT scan? They may, to assess for internal injury, and will they need to be monitored in the ER or admitted overnight? They may. So it's important to know, any loss of consciousness, your child needs to go to the hospital right away. 
So now if your child is conscious, so for example, they're crying, that is a good sign. That means they are alert. We don't want them crying, obviously, but I'm happy to see that they're conscious. Before you move them, you want to make sure if they have a neck injury that you are very gentle with them and don't move the neck. It's called immobilizing the neck, and that means holding their head and their neck stable with their shoulders and moving them to a safe space. If your child is not moving their lower extremities, if their child is complaining of a neck injury, I want them to be evaluated. Please be gentle when moving them. And I attached a picture right here on how you would hold your child when you're trying to move them to make sure that you're immobilizing the spine. So now is the time to get them to a safe area. I need you to make sure that if they're on a higher level that you're able to bring them down safely to a safe area so that you can do an assessment of what's going on. An example would be just so your child is playing in a football league and injures their head. You want to make sure you pull them to the sidelines and obviously are not assessing them in the middle of the field. You want to be in a safe area to do a proper assessment. So you're going to assess them for any cuts. So just say they hit their forehead. They may have a laceration. I'm going to do a separate video in the future about wound care, but when you're assessing a wound, here's what I want you to look for. You want to first hold pressure to any bleeding spot. So if you don't have a napkin, use a clean shirt, use whatever you can to stop the bleeding because you want to hold pressure to stop that. When you do get a chance, you're going to assess the wound. Is the wound edges far apart. If they're far apart and you need to push them together for them to stay closed, you need to seek evaluation for possible stitches or something called Dermabond or glue. Dermabond is a very common thing that we use for wounds and this is basically something that helps approximate the wound edges. What does it mean approximate the wound edges? That means that we want to bring the wound edges as close together as possible for maximum healing. So if you have to push that wound together, you know that there may be a chance of stitches or Dermabond. Now depending on the location will determine whether your child can get Dermabond, which is glue, or if they'll need stitches. So if you're not sure, go to the emergency room or your child's clinician or call them to get the best advice on what needs to be done for that wound. Lacerations or openings on the back of the scalp typically need staples. So staples is what we recommend for the scalp because it will hold the laceration together as best as possible. And again, our goal with wound closure is to provide the best treatment possible in terms of cosmetic and healing. You also want to assess if there's any major bruising or bumps that you're seeing. This may not be immediately noticeable, so that's something that you're going to want to monitor if your child is acting well. But what you're going to want to look for, is there any bruising under the eyes, bruising behind the ears? Is there any bruising anywhere else? Are there any lumps or bumps on the head? Lumps or bumps on the front of the head are actually really common. Um, they can actually look like a goose egg, like the pictured above. So it can be really common. We'll go over management of that. But you want to look, are there any bumps or lumps on the back of the head and also any bruising like I mentioned. Another thing is you want to look if they're having a really watery nose. And I'm not talking about a runny nose because they're crying. I'm not talking about snot coming out. I'm talking like all of a sudden it just looks like water is dripping out of their nose. This can be a sign of an internal injury. So it's really important if your child is leaking what looks like water from their nose that you just run this by your child's clinician. They're going to want to assess that child. It is very obvious. It's very, very clear. It's not like snot. It's not like tears. But this is something important that I would want you to monitor. So after this initial evaluation, if your child has loss of consciousness, you need them evaluated as soon as possible, emergency room. If your child is conscious and has any open lacerations that you would have to close the wound edges with your finger for them to come together, you need to get them evaluated. If they are bleeding and the bleeding's not stopping, get them evaluated. Or if they have any big lumps or bumps on the back of their scalp, it's just good to run it by your child's clinician. So now just say your child cried, you notice no obvious injuries, you need to monitor a few things after a head injury. First is they're reporting a constant headache. My head hurts, my head hurts, my head hurts. If in the 48 hours after the injury they're complaining of constant headaches, run it by your child's clinician so that they can assess if your child needs a further evaluation. In a non-speaking child, so if you have a younger child or a child who's non-speaking, this may be that they're inconsolable. You can't get them to calm down. You are okay to give Tanal or Motrin for these kind of minor injuries as long as everything I go over is okay. But if they're truly inconsolable and you can't get them to calm down, it's important to seek an evaluation. Another thing is if they're having dizziness that's not going away or is happening repetitively. If they're vomiting more than two or three times, and why not one time? Commonly, we do see vomiting 
one time after a head injury. And the idea is that with all the adrenaline and excitement, it can cause their whole vagus system to get overwhelmed and vomit. So we don't mind one, but we want to know if it's a repetitive thing. So please remember that, that one episode of vomiting can be very normal, but two or three, we want your child evaluated because we want to make sure, is this a sign of any intracranial injury? Obvious things would be difficulty walking, talking, communicating at their baseline, complaining of visual changes or ringing in the ear, seizure activity, so if you're seeing any rhythmic jerking of any extremity, and another big one, they're just drowsy and not interacting with you at baseline, and also not interested in hydration. So when assessing your child 24 to 48 hours after a head injury, you want to be monitoring these things. Vomiting that's repetitive is very important for us to know, and also just in general, how your child's looking. Are they interactive? Are they consolable? Are they hydrated? These are all important things to monitor. Why do we care about head injuries? Most head injuries are very minor. But if your child is not looking well or any of the signs I mentioned above, you want to seek medical attention because we need to make sure does that child need a CAT scan or CT scan. So the CAT scan is going to assess for any internal injury such as brain bleed. So it's really important for us to know if the child lost consciousness, if the child is not acting well, and we have different criteria that we look at to determine do we need to get a CT for this child. We use something called the PCARM guidelines. The PCARM guidelines is what I'm attaching here. It basically looks at the situation to see based on data if a child needs a head CT. CTs do have small amounts of radiation. So when we decide to use them, we are asking ourselves, is there a benefit to this versus a risk? The risk is very low, but we want to make sure, are we over imaging or is there a reason why this child needs to be truly imaged? Sometimes when you go to the ER, they may not recommend CT imaging right away. They'll watch your child for about four to six hours to see how they're doing with all of the things I mentioned. So now if your child is under two years of age, you're going to be monitoring all the things I mentioned, but there are some other guidelines that I would want your child monitoring for. If your child is under three months of age with a head injury, regardless of how they're acting, it's important to seek medical attention. The other big one is if your child has a hematoma or a swelling on the back of the head. Swellings on the front of the head are not as concerning, but of course, if you are concerned, you speak to your child's clinician. A common question I get asked is wanting imaging for a concussion. Imaging is not necessarily needed for a concussion, but of course, if your child is not acting well, vomiting, had loss of consciousness, your child's clinician or ER will want a CT scan to assess for any internal injuries. A concussion is essentially a bruise on the brain and like bruises on our body, they do heal. But if your child is experiencing prolonged concussion symptoms, headaches, sensitivity to light, sensitivity to sound, ringing in the ear, you definitely want to get them evaluated to see, is this a concussion? Do they need to stay out of certain activities? So now you talk to your child's clinician because you were concerned and they send you home. You want to ask them what you need to be monitoring based on what happened with the injury. So for those goose eggs, the big swelling on the forehead that you have probably seen, they're going to look really, really big and they will go down. Sometimes I see them last for weeks and even after that, I can still see some soft tissue texture changes to the forehead after that swelling has gotten better. It's important to ice this if you can. If you have a younger child who's not cooperative, this can mean having to put a screen on so that you can ice them down in that area to reduce the swelling and provide comfort. In terms of needing to wake your child up from sleep, this is when I would want you to use the guidance from your child's clinic. If you're monitoring all that I said, that the child's not vomiting, the child is interacting with you at baseline, the child is eating and drinking how you would expect them to be eating and drinking, you don't have to wake them up. Now, if any of those things were happening where they were kind of sluggish, they were kind of not acting at baseline, that is when you're going to talk to your clinician and they'll tell you, does that child need to be woken up or can that child sleep? You want to make sure that you're monitoring all of the symptoms I mentioned. I'm attaching it here so that you can remember this, screenshot it, save it. It's really important that you are looking out for this after a head injury and the peak time is 48 hours after a head injury. Now remember with concussion symptoms they may still have some residual symptoms such as headache and ringing in the ears or blurry vision or sensitivity to light so it's still important after those 48 hours if that's still happening to let your clinician know. In terms of pain meds it's okay to give Motrin and Tylenol as needed age appropriate. Please talk to your child's clinician if you're finding that you're having to give this around the clock or more frequently. It's important that they get evaluated if pain meds are not helping. Lastly, please speak to your child's clinician or go to the ER if you are concerned.
Remember when I do these videos, this is just to give you education, but your gut is way more important than anything that I can say in this video. So if you're concerned that your child's not acting right, if you want someone to lay eyes on that child, if you want someone to observe that child, you have that, right? Remember medicine is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So you have access to someone to assess your child whenever you need it. Thank you for joining me. Make sure you watch my mouth injuries video that I released today. And as always, hit that thumbs up sign, comment below, follow me at Pete's Doc Talk on Instagram, and please make sure you subscribe to this channel to support my endeavors on Pete's Doc Talk TV, and I'll see you next week.